Philippians today and this important topic of refining friendship. And I just have to say, I'm so blessed by the call to worship that Margaret shared about friendship and the children's time that Jim facilitated. Because already we've been thinking about who are the people we call friends and how do we define good friendship, being a good friend. I wanted to start this morning with a graphic that I saw recently when I was at ACA. And it's a way to think about the different spheres in our lives of where we invest a lot of time and energy. Um, It's from this book called Missional Essentials. And um, basically, it's trying to help us think about the people that we interact with. And they use the terms in this book, first place, second place, and third place. And, And in the book, they suggest that we spend most of our time in these two places, at home with our family, or if we're working, at work, invested in the things that we're doing there. And they said, really, this third place in our culture today is one of those places that's really kind of changing, and it has been changing over the past 30 years. The third place would be uh, the public neutral spaces in our society where people gather and build friendship and relationship. The cafes and the bookstores and the libraries and the YMCAs and, and even churches, those neutral places where people can go to connect. And basically, over the past 30 years, the third places in our culture have been shrinking and getting smaller and smaller and less used. There's an example that they give in their book of of just the sport bowling. And they said over the past 30 years, the nature of, of the way people do bowling has changed. There used to be a lot more bowling leagues 30 years ago. And now, actually, the number of people that bowl has increased over the past 30 years, but the the amount of people who are in leagues has decreased. So you have a lot of people bowling alone. They're not bowling in community anymore. And they were saying in their book, there's lots of other examples like that. And as with the rise of digital media and people sitting down and interacting with others through their computers and mobile devices, these third places have been even more diminished. And basically, as we're going to jump into our passage today and hear what Paul has to say about good friendship, I hope we'll keep in mind the year that we're in, the year of mission, where we're going as a church, and realize that third places are actually ripe. They're great opportunities for us to do ministry, just to go out and be present, as I said, at libraries, going to the playtime with our kids at libraries. I know a couple of people in our church already do that. Uh, Going out to the cafe to play music. I know Jeremy Clevenger will play different concerts, and you get to know people and build relationships in those places And as we go into our passage today, I think we'll see that these third places are a really ripe area for us to do ministry. You know, a lot of times when we think of mission, we often think of inviting people to our church and making church as attractive as possible to welcome outsiders and to draw people here where they can hear the word and and be fed. And 20... To 25 years ago, there was a big emphasis in this movement called the church growth movement, which said if you, if you change the style of your music and the way your sanctuary looks and have coffee bars and all kinds of things to draw people, you're going to be real successful at mission. Well, at this presentation I went to, they said that really over the past 25 years, that approach has been tried and tried and tried. And what they realized is the, there's a flaw in that thinking that if we, can make, if we build it, they will come, so to speak. If we can make church attractive enough, people will come to us. The flaw in that thinking is we're asking them to be the missionaries. We're asking them to cross all the cultural boundaries if they're not familiar with the church building or the language that we use or the people that are in our congregation. We're asking them to cross all those boundaries to come to us so they can hear the message. And the new approach to, to mission is empowering each one of us to go out in our workplace, in our interactions in the community, and make connections there. And that's where most of the ministry of the kingdom will happen when we're being missional. So it's a difference in thinking. We come here to be recharged on Sundays. We still invite people here. But we should see the church primarily as a launching pad for the week where we go out as ministers uh, carrying the message with us of hope. And in our basic day-to-day relationships, we are being missional. I want to take a little bit of time here to real quickly touch base with you on Philippians. That's the letter we're looking at today. And Philippians is such a wonderful, shorter letter. And really, you hear Paul's joy coming out in Philippians. He is just delighted with this community 
that he's writing to. Now, they have problems and they have things that he wants to address, but you can really sense that um, he is filled with joy. He is, he's so happy to be doing ministry with them. Paul was writing from prison. This is one of those letters that, you know, you, you can tell, you know, his experience being in prison has informed what he has to say. And he's writing them from prison. And he's writing to thank them because they've been generous in supporting his ministry. Uh, and he's, he's sending this letter with one of their friends, Epaphroditus, back to them to thank them. But he's also writing them to encourage them to be unified as a church, to speak about any division and to say, remain in, in one mind, one mindset in Christ. And so that's the message we're going to go deep with this morning. What Paul means by being in one mind, having the mindset of Christ. What, how does that relate to unity and how does that relate to our understanding of friendship? So let's start with the opening of our passage today. Um, I'd like just to highlight the words in yellow to you. So I'm going to read the white text, and if you would please read the yellow text, starting here, um, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if you have any, if any, if any, if any, then make my joy complete. So we know Paul is already joyful when he's writing them. He, he appreciates them so much, but he, he's saying there's something that is in your midst. You have these things that you just read. Encouragement from being united with Christ, comfort from his love, common sharing in the spirit, tenderness and compassion. You have these things, and you can make my joy complete by responding to those things you have. Um, and so initial question for us to think about as we're starting our passage here is how vital for Paul is God's transforming work in our lives? Because Paul sees each of these things as God's transforming work. This union with Christ, this comfort from his love, the sharing in the spirit, and the tenderness and compassion that comes from God. Paul sees those are really important things, and the Philippians have them. So Paul really wants to see something happen because those things are in their lives. And we could say, those things are in our lives too as believers today. And because they're there and God's at work in that way, we can expect certain things to flow out of it. Now, I want, I want to highlight something here. The, the passage we just read, you see that word if appears four times. So what's Paul trying to do here with these if statements? If you have, if there's any, if there's any, if there's any. What's he trying to tell them? What, what's he getting at here? I found this graphic in a good commentary by Stephen Runge, and he suggests that Paul here is trying to lead them to a certain conclusion. Now, we, we might remember when we were children and we did something wrong, our parents might have called us aside and, and started asking us if questions, you know. Jacob, you know, do you know what it's like to have somebody do something bad to you? Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> Jacob, do you love your sister? Yes, I love my sister. What do you think it's like, Jacob, if, if you uh, hit your sister in the arm? Uh, it should probably causes her pain. Then, Jacob, you shouldn't treat your sister that way. <laughs> That's the kind of line, uh, you know, line of argumentation, right? If this is the case, if you understand this, if you know this, then it should translate into this kind of action. So that's what Paul's doing here. He's telling the Philippians, if you are united to Christ, if he's the Lord of your life, if he's coming and he's doing things in your heart, if you have experienced his love, if you know that the Holy Spirit is active and has gifted you for ministry, if you have the tenderness and compassion of God, then, then, Philippians, and then those of Worcester Mennonite, be like-minded and agree. Be like-minded and agree. Once again, we hear Paul's call to unity here. So why do you think Paul places so much emphasis on unity here in these relationships that, that the Philippians have with one another? Why does he put so much unity, su such emphasis on unity? We can see it here in the second verse of our passage. Make my joy complete. And once again, will you please read the, the, the font in yellow? Make my joy complete by... And 
So you, you, you hear the unity, the call to unity there, being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. Once again, here's another picture from Stephen Runge's commentary. So having the same mind means these things here. These are what Paul just listed for us. It has to do with the love that we have for one another. It has to do with our unity in the Holy Spirit. It has to do with also rejecting ways of being, ways of being selfish or acting out of conceit. It has to do with counting others more important than ourselves and not only looking to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. So Paul's painting a picture here for us of what unity looks like. And he sees it as a very desirable thing. And he, and he says, if you want to make my joy complete, seek after this kind of unity. So I want, to, I want to lead us here to a final question as we think about Paul's message. What are some contrasts between worldly and Christ-focused ways of doing relationship? And you kind of, kind of might think on verses 3 and 4 here of our passage today, which I have um, on, on the screen. We're going to look at them here. So I've tried to highlight the worldly, what I would call worldly ways of doing relationship in blue, and then the Christ-focused ways in, in yellow. And we've just looked at them. Um, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Paul's identified a problem there, and he says that if these are present, they're going to undermine your relationships. If you have ambition as a motivator in your relationships, it's going to undermine what God has for you. If you have conceit in your interactions with others and it's fueling how you behave, it's going to undermine your relationships. What else does he say? Rather... In humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. The same mindset. What is this mindset that Paul is talking about here? Let's look at it once again at a third graphic and the last one here from Rungi's commentary. So if we think of our own interests here as represented by the circle we see on the left, that would be our needs and what we want out of a relationship or friendship or, or what we understand um, things should be like. And then you see here on the, on the right, this blue circle is another person you're interacting with. Maybe it's a, a, another believer, another fellow brother or sister in Christ, or maybe it's a different person outside of the church completely. This can work in either case. But... They have their own sense of what friendship means and their own needs and their own understanding. And what Paul says and what he calls us to here is when we're interacting with others, we have to work hard to not just stay over here on the left, but we have to work hard to build common areas of unity and agreement with other people. We have to be able to listen to them, to learn what they're looking for and they're needing, we need to be able to affirm them and encourage them. And as we do that more, our spheres come together. And there's this common area where we can encourage one another. So I like to think of this picture in terms of the church and ask the bigger question, like what if you think of these spheres as interests of groups of people in the church? You know, Paul had to deal with this all the time. We mentioned his letter to the Romans, his letter to the Galatians. We're dealing with trying to bring different groups together and to build their common life together. So in his day and age, you had on the one side the Judaizers who kept wanting to point back to the Old Covenant and the practices of the law. And then on the right, you had certain Gentile believers who almost pushed to the extreme of uh, uh, not having a sense of, of obligation or duty or, or ethics and emphasizing freedom so much that they could get into trouble. And Paul's trying to bring these two groups together and say... Let's bring our interests together and build in common agreement who we see Christ calling us to be. And let's try to listen to one another and listen to the voice of God and where he's leading us. So we could think of the church today in our modern time. You know, this could be applied to different styles of worship. This could be applied to different emphases in theology. In any case, you know, Paul would say, bring our groups together, listen with the mindset of Christ, and all the qualities that we heard of before, 
with love and tenderness and compassion and seeking the unity of the Spirit. And try to seek after your common life together. So what does this look like in your relationships in, during the week? What, how would you work at this? It would likely mean when we're talking with others, we don't just think of our own interests and what we want to share about our lives, but we really prioritize the act of listening and the act of hospitality. So as we're engaging somebody, we want to find out about their life, what's going on in their lives. We want to show them hospitality. Maybe we want to have a meal with them and spend time hearing their stories and building this common life together and modeling for them and letting the, the love of Christ flow through you to them this, in this pattern that Paul has given for us. It means not only on an individual level, but as the church, too, when we interact with others, we need to practice listening. We need to be in missional communities that send one another out to be good listeners, to practice Christian hospitality, to be good neighbors. You know, there's a wonderful book written by the authors that I started with called The Art of Neighboring. When they argue just even the people next door, if we invite them to a meal or practice good listening and hospitality to them, that's our ministry. And maybe one of the biggest things we can think of is, is our Lord Jesus. If it's in the nature of our Lord Jesus to have so many meals with people and invite them in and listen to them and to share with them as he did life with them. If our Lord Jesus modeled this, if it's in his nature, the very nature of God, that we listen to others and affirm them and include them and take time with them, then how much more should, so should we do this as the church? If it's in God's own nature and we see it lived out in Jesus' life, then we need to be about this. This is what ministry is. This is what we're called to as a church, to live out life in this way that invites others in and in our ordinary, everyday interactions to practice listening, to practice hospitality, and to practice that Christ-centered way of relating, not out of ambition and not out of conceit. So, I want to leave you with two things today, if you would, this upcoming week. Please think about ways you can have the mind of Christ in your relationships. So, Margaret asked the question at the very beginning, who are our friends? So, you can think about your friends and you can think about the relationships you have with them. You can think about your family relationships and, and ask the question, how does the fact that I'm united to Christ, as Paul said, and that I have the Holy Spirit within me, and I have this calling to see my relationships as ministry, the way I relate to these people is part of my calling, that mind, how can I be more hospitable? How can I be a better listener? How can I search for that common ground between us? Or if you prefer to do number two, this is also good. Please pray the words of this hymn this week, Forth in Thy Name, number 415 in the hymnal. It's also another great hymn to really get us thinking about this dynamic and this call of refining friendship. So this will be the last Sunday that we say this statement of belief together. And so I want to close by inviting you to say this with me from the book, A World Worth Saving. Will you join me? We believe that God loves the world so deeply that God became human like us, the person of Jesus. We believe that God redeems the world out of divine love. We further believe that God not only loves the world, but believes in its value and worth. The Creator surrounds us with love and extends grace to us and all people because God believes we are worthy of redemption. We act in concert with God to extend grace, mercy, and love.